joining us this afternoon for the annual George Center for Honor Studies Senior Thesis Presentation. And for those of you who were here yesterday, thank you for returning. My name is Brittany Sonberg. I'm an Associate Professor of Art and the new Director of the Honors Program here at Greensboro College. Those here in person, President Zarda, assembled faculty, advisors, and students. And those here with us virtually, we appreciate your support of our students. A special thanks to IT for making the remote viewing possible. These soon-to-be graduates of Greensboro College have spent the past two years working towards this goal. More than half of that time was under the unprecedented circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of our students had to change their projects entirely, and others had to significantly adjust their approach to adapt to this situation. This event today is the culmination of their thesis process in the honors program. The opportunity to share their diverse research and ideas is a significant milestone in their academic experience. As for how the presentations will go, five minute mark, we'll have to um, or maybe 23 minutes, we'll have to allow for one more question um, because we want to make sure that we can keep each presentation uh, starting on the half hour. If there is time between and you're staying for more than one presentation, you're welcome to take a short break. We have bottled water in the back. Um, but before we begin, please join me in congratulating all of the senior honor students on the tremendous achievement of getting to this point. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm Neil Clegg, and it was my pleasure to serve as advisor for Lindsay Mead, who has recognized early in the process that the pandemic would pose enormous problems for live entertainment, and um, didn't look simply at local, but looked at a larger basis to track when she approached me to be her advisor, I suggested that we uh, take more of a, a local, as in North Carolina, look, as well as a look at some of my friends in New York, whose careers were, uh, to say the least, sidelined by the pandemic. And she's done a remarkable job with this, uh, tracking down any, num well, a large number of entertainers. Uh, who have suffered through this period and in some ways found it an interesting time of growth. But I'll let her, des let her describe that for you now. Lindsay?
he breaks down three social media sites to, for their effectiveness. Twitter, which was used to provide a constant live tweeting update to the audience members about shows that were happening and different panels. It also encouraged audience members to send in questions when they couldn't be there. One, two, three. <laughs> I'm going to try again. Family members, can you hear me? <laughs> My phone's down there, so I can't tell if you're texting me or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can also double check and make sure I turn this on. Pretty sure I did. This is on. Both on? Thank you, everybody. And this gives you a chance to look at my lovely research question. I'm really going to read on this slide because I'm going to go over them in the next slides, but this gives you a chance to see where we're going from here. <laughs> I can keep talking if it helps. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm good to go. All right, so these are the three research questions that I ended up with for my thesis. These questions were developed after my topic changed so suddenly last spring. And so these are not the questions that I asked in my interviews. Those were developed on an individual basis. And if you're interested in reading all of them, they can be found in Appendix A of my thesis. The first question was, how has COVID-19 impacted performance artists and the entertainment industry? And the very short answer is that everything was canceled. Ways that artists found to create during this time. At the collegiate level, uh, this was a good chance for students to get to used to performing with technology that they hadn't had to use before. At Elon University, their performance of Hamlet was canceled by COVID in person but they decided to take it to the digital um, platform. And the way that they did this was they put it over Zoom and streamed it on Facebook Live from the students' homes. This was actors and the equity actors their technical elements, all of their set, their lights, their costumes, everything. So it became more of a storytelling experience than an actual theater performance. At Greensboro College, I was able to interview with and sit in on a live rehearsal or a virtual rehearsal for the cast of Suffrage Sisters. And while rehearsing online allowed them to rehearse the show prior to coming to campus and follow CDC guidelines on campus, many of them said that the performance or that the experience would have been better for them had they had the opportunity to rehearse in person the entire time. The professionals that I interviewed said that they were more concerned about making a living rather than what type of work they were doing during the pandemic. One of the musicians that I interviewed told me that because of COVID, he um, Several of the other musicians I interviewed said they had to find survival jobs in other fields in order to stay afloat. Both of the theater companies that I interviewed said that everything that they had been doing up until that point had to go virtual. that allowed for one-on-one -on -one instruction with their students. One of the companies I interviewed specializes in children's theater, and they had to completely rework their lesson plan once they went to in-person teaching. Whereas previously, they would have students forming clumps on stage to create stage pictures and play games. All of a sudden, nobody could touch one another and had to be spread out. This company that I got an interview with said that they experimented with dance film during the pandemic. Usually they do a performance of the Nutcracker around the holidays. The dancers 
film together and presented that as their show rather than a live performance. What digital technology was used to create and present performances? Additionally, how important was social media? And overall, the best platform for communicating and performing live was Zoom. It was easy to use. It could support a large number of people. The only downside was if you wanted to have longer than 45 minutes for your meeting, you had to pay for premium, which not everybody was willing to or had the funds to do. As mentioned before, Elon University did their performance on Zoom with the actors, and that footage was uploaded to Facebook Live. The problem with that was that the actors had no idea how the audience members were reacting to the show. But the audience members were having a great time in the comments section, and one person told me that they were behaving like groundlings during the show, talking to one another, having conversations, recognizing old friends, all that good stuff. Many of the professionals that I interviewed told me that social media is already a viable platform for performance. It's just being utilized more by incoming artists than those who are already established in the field. Those who are already established were using social media more advertise their performances and um, one company said that they were starting to put more focus into creating high quality content than they did before COVID. However, the internet is not perfect. It's not a good place for professionals to make money unless they have millions of followers. One musician told me that if she were to upload a song to a streaming website, she would make three tenths of a cent per stream. So unless your song goes viral, or in case, unless you're a very well-known name, you're probably not going to make much money off of this. Post-pandemic, what will happen to the concept of live performances? Is there a way to utilize digital technology while performing live? Overall, the pandemic appeared to be a kind of renaissance for artists and performers. There's a lot of new content that's coming out that has only been possible through digital technology. And many of the professionals that I interviewed said that they're expecting to see a lot more digital and hybrid performances post-pandemic. Additionally, reopening live shows post-pandemic is going to cause some economic issues. If we have to continue seating audiences with social distancing, as we do now, companies are going to have less seats that they're able to sell. However, people who have been inside for almost a year are going to want to go out and see live shows. So if you have a high demand for seats, but not enough seats to sell, you're going to have to raise your prices to balance it out. One of the musicians that I spoke to said that he's already had to raise the individual prices for hiring him just to make up for the loss during the pandemic. So what can artists do to combat this? I had to do a little bit more research on a theater company known as Team Star Kid. They were founded in 2009 at the University of Michigan, and they created their first parody musical called A Very Potter Musical. Rather than making DVDs for the cast, they uploaded the show to YouTube because it was cheaper, faster, and easier. And the show went viral. To this day, the video has over 17 million views. And since then, they have done over 20 other performances that are all performed live, recorded, edited, and then uploaded for free onto YouTube. In 2018, Team Star Kid introduced a new concept into their shows called Digital Tickets. These shows are now performed in LA, but they have fans all over the United States and some in other countries. To make their shows more accessible to everybody, they decided to have a single camera in the back of the theater, kind of how we do now, and they would record the show from that one angle. Access to that footage was sold at $15 a ticket, and an audience member had 72 hours to view the footage as many times as they wanted to. By doing so, the audience members still supported the production, but they got to see the show before the free YouTube release without having to travel to LA to see the show. Um, we're gonna go back. Um, if other theater performance or performance companies were to use this idea, it could solve the economic issues mentioned earlier. Theoretically, you could place a camera in any angle of the show and sell an unlimited number of tickets for that one angle. In conclusion, digital performances are probably going to become, if not the norm, more normal in the future. Uh, partially due to the pandemic and partially due to advancements in digital technology. Social media is no longer just for personal sharing. It's used as a marketing tool, a place to interact with audience members, and can now be used as a performance platform. And the future of live performances is uncertain, but there are many tactics that have already been used by professionals that could be exploited more in the future. And in order for live performances to remain an important part of our lives in times of crisis, the show must go online.
Thank you very much. I will now be taking questions. Yes. <laughs> I think that it's a little bit of both because there were several artists that I talked to who said that the companies that were hiring them to perform wanted to make sure everybody was safe. Um, a couple of the musicians said that they performed during like company gatherings over Zoom. Um, so it depends on it depends on who has the money. Um, and the other part of it is is that it is convenient and um, something that I didn't mention in this presentation that I did research for my prospectus was the concept of bootlegs where people illegally film shows and theoretically these concepts could be used to prevent bootlegging from being an issue in the future. So to answer your question both. <laughs> I think that it's definitely a possibility. None of them mentioned it specifically, but um, we were talking a lot about the benefits to certain types of social media, and I don't think that there's any one perfect type out there for what we're doing currently. So, mm -hmm. anybody else have questions? <laughs> yes. I know you interviewed several people. My question would be, I know what happened in the spring. You left school, you didn't come back, so no performances occurred. How did you all, and I saw several of your um, how did you all have to adapt in your own theater program to COVID? Oh, so the shows that were practiced before we came in at the beginning of the fall semester did have to rehearse online. Um, I know Professor Schramm, your show rehearsed online for a little while from what I saw from Hannah Yet and Paige Hires. Um, and then once we got back on campus, all of our shows were performed with masks on, with social distancing, and just taking as much precaution as possible. And all of our audiences were seated with social distancing. But you did it, and we were so grateful. <laughs> I know you were too. Yes. Yes. Um, I'm curious about the Yes. <laughs> yes, I've been trying to keep up with that. My parents keep, before the pandemic, they kept sending me job openings for them. <laughs> um, and so definitely I was looking at that and going, wow, that's something that nobody could have predicted would happen. <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Um, in one of the articles that I did in my literature review, um, the first one with Dr. Chatsi Christodoulou, she explains how memory is impacted by digital performances and whether or not you're remembering the actual performance or you're remembering the video of the performance. Um, the response to Elon's show as well from the cast and crew said that they felt they were performing more storytelling. And personally, I think that the way we're doing it right now 
isn't really live theater, a live concert, a live performance. I feel like that's something that we need to put more effort into creating a hybrid of the two if we're going to continue down this line of digital performances. Well, what's come out of it, uh, on the flip side, they also talk about these three critics, the hundreds if not thousands of responses they get from people who do not have access to live theater that live in places that they'll never, they'll never go to New York, they'll never go to see, there's, they're not close to a touring show. So to be able to see things in person, online, sometimes live, sometimes not, has been tremendous for them. Seeing shows that they, you know, shows that they never would see any other way, mm -hmm. and now they have that opportunity. So that's a plus, I guess. Which yes. Circles right back to your original thesis. Topic. <laughs> With the bootlegs, yes. Yeah. Um, especially if theater companies were to start recording and producing their own videos of their shows, there wouldn't be a need for people to sneak cameras in film a show and put it on YouTube because there are benefits to bootlegs, especially me. Last semester ago, back last spring when I was having a it was very useful for me to be able to research Grey Gardens and find the whole off-Broadway show online. And even though me watching it wasn't supporting the company at all, it was a useful tool for my education, and I feel like if theater companies and music and dance and if all of them were to start putting out their own materials, it would have the same educational benefit, but we would actually be able to support the companies. There's even a parent company that's like this, maybe others. Um, the New York City Library, I think, records every Broadway production and mm -hmm. copies of it from way back when, but you can only access it if you go in there and you have specific reasons to see it as part of research. If that ever opened up, Yes. Were she studying that? In the that yeah, that was part of my first one. Mm -hmm. yes. Did you come across any companies discussing the possibilities of immersive experience or virtual reality with the future of using social media as platforms and then how that would play in with, um, with the question of, is it theater? Like you're watching mm -hmm. it on a screen, but you're distracted by things around you. You're not, you're not experiencing the immersive experience that you would have in the yeah, um, none of the people I interviewed talked about that, but one thing that I did at research in my original topic about immersive theater was in high school we had to do research on designing shows for um, uh, neurodivergent audiences and how the way that theaters are designed where you sit in the dark close together, bright lights up on stage isn't always the best situation for an audience member to experience a show. And so one of the benefits to performing virtually could also be that people who wouldn't be able to make it through a live performance in person can watch it on their own time at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Professor Clegg? In the 1920s, there were articles written, uh, or at least I read a few, that questioned the extent to which a movie of a performance was actually a performance. Mm -hmm. Now, no one would question that about a film. So my, my curiosity is, how long will it be before we take the virtual performance to be preferable to the live performance? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that depends, too, on whether or not it's a live show recorded once and then that footage is recycled, and whether or whether it's a camera is set up to live stream and every night the show goes up, it's a new live stream of the show. Because um, the research I did a couple years ago on silent films um, was talking about how when silent films became popular, you could just transport the film reels through the, all the theaters, as opposed to before that when we had, um, I believe it was Vaudeville Perry that we were talking about in American musical theater history. Um, first it started out, the performers would travel the circuit and present their shows, but once they were able to film it and just send the fil film reel around, that was cheaper for the companies. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have an online question from a Jared Mee. That is my father. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Your father, he said he's asking for a friend. Okay. <laughs> what are Lindsay's post graduation plans? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I told you this yesterday or the day before. Um, I have been hired by Aflac as an insurance agent. 
So I will be working Monday through Friday for AFLAC remotely. And um, yesterday I was offered my job back at the Greensboro Children's Museum, which is reopening next month. So I will be working for them on the weekends and just working, working, working all the time. So hopefully I can move out by the fall. So <laughs> that's what you guys want. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> and if that is it, thank you very much. <laughs> wishes to convey that she is present four years ago as freshmen rise to this occasion. From Sheila, Caterino, who will be presenting her thesis project, Law and Literature, the Benefits for First Year Law Students. I have known Keely since her first year at GC as a freshman, where I had her for the second semester of the honors every year since, whether in the classroom or for independent study or as her honors thesis advisor. When we first met regarding her thesis project, Keely was at a loss for precisely what she wanted to do. I'm pleased to say that the project she eventually settled on became for, or at least a robust reflection of, so much that her educational trajectory has since comprised her internship with a publishing company, her continued work with The Liar, her co-receipt of the Mary L. Ginn Award for Excellence in English, her receipt of this year's Alpha Chi Award, which is voted upon by her peers, and the fact that next year she will be attending law school, where she hopes to continue her law and literature journey by concentrating on intellectual property law. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Keely Caterino and I'm going to be discussing my thesis titled Law and Literature, the Benefits for First Year Law Students. ...of what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So I'm going to start by giving you some background on the field, what is law and literature exactly. Um, and then I'm going to discuss with you a problem that I found when I began studying the field and my questions that arose as a result of finding this problem. And then after that, I'm going to talk to you about the methods that I addressed my research question with, and then I'm going to talk to you about my results, beginning with my synthesis and then going into my analyses of four literary works. And then finally, I have some concluding thoughts that just kind of First, what is law and literature? So the definition of law and literature is that it is an interdisciplinary movement that studies the relationships between the fields of law and literature. So sorry. Um, so law and literature first emerged as a distinguishable field in 1973 following James Boyd White's publication of The Legal Imagination. Um, so before 1973, there had been between law and literature, but it didn't really gain traction in academia until James Boyd White published this text um, that kind of gave the field legitimacy. Um, and so then going forward after 1973, once the field gained traction, it divided into two main branches. So the first branch is law as literature, which focuses on analyzing the law. Um, and legal works as literature by employing different literary theories and techniques. So an example of someone studying something under this branch um, could be a law and literature scholar studying the syntax of a judicial opinion. Aims to help better people's understanding of the law. So as an English major, I just found this 
branch a little bit more interesting, so that's what I did all of my research in. So when I was studying this branch, I noticed um, an issue. So while law and literature scholars agree that literature does benefit law students, um, they could not agree on exactly how literature benefits law students. Um, so as I was studying this, I noticed that these, um, all of these different opinions could be classified into two distinct categories. The first one being um, that literature can provide real world context to law students and that's why it can help them. And then the second being that literature helps law students because it provides them with a more human oriented examination of the law than law schools typically take. And so after noticing this split and this divide, I came up with these two research questions. The first, how can literature benefit future or first year law students? And the second, how might the works of literature in Cold Blood, To Kill a Mockingbird, Billy Bud Sailor, and Walden II specifically benefit future or first year law students? Um, and then, so these are my methods for how I went about um, researching the answers to these questions. So my first step was to collect more data from the field. I wanted to get as much information from law and literature scholars as I could as to why um, they thought literature benefited law students. Um, so then once I collected all of this, I went through and I analyzed it to pull out all of those ideas. And then after I did this, I had my synthesis, which is the first part of my results. Um, and I'll talk more about my synthesis in a little bit. And so once I had my synthesis, which is this collection of all law and literature scholars opinions on how literature benefits law students, I then applied it to four works of literature that possess legal themes as was consistent with my law in literature branch um, and have been deemed a worthy in some way to first year law students by professionals in both literature and um, legal studies. Um, and so the books that I ended up choosing were To Kill a Mockingbird, In Cold Blood, Billy Bud, Sailor, and Walden II, as you saw in my research questions. Um, and then after I applied my synthesis to these four literary works, I then created an explanation for first year law students about why and how literature is beneficial to them, drawing on specific examples from each of these books. And so now I'm going to get into some of my results. So first, my first um, set of results is my synthesis. So my synthesis is a collection of law and literature scholars' opinions on how students can benefit from literature. Um, so I organized my synthesis consistently with the two opinions, the two distinct opinions um, that I initially found in the field. So my first category is that literature provides a deeper understanding of important values in the profession. And so underneath this category, I just provided some examples of scholarly opinions that I collected. So for example, one is that literature humanizes law students whereas another scholar thinks that literature constantly questions people's moral codes and stereotypes so that law students can see the ethical requirement that makes them human. And then underneath the next category is that literature benefits law students because it provides them with real world context. And so then um, one scholar under this category thinks that often a sense of background or cultural context surrounding issues is excluded from records of legal cases. So by using literature, um, law students can fill in these gaps. And now I'm going to get into some of my specific My, the first book I'm going to talk about is To Kill a Mockingbird. So in case no one has read To Kill a Mockingbird, I wanted to just give like a very brief summary, like some very brief background information on the book. So this book details race and justice in the South through the eyes of a child. And this child is Scout Finch, she's our narrator. Um, and the legal theme present in this book is that the law does not always result in justice. Um, and we also see this in another, this theme in another book that I'm going to talk about later. It's see Atticus Finch defend Tom Robinson. So Tom Robinson is an African-American man who is falsely accused by a white woman of sexual assault. 
And so Atticus Finch, much to the dismay of his um, surrounding white neighbors, decides that he is going to defend Tom Robinson in court. And he does a great job and um, proves that Tom Robinson is in fact innocent, but the all-white jury in a racially charged South didn't care and convicted him anyways, thus um, giving us our legal theme of the law does not always result in justice. And then, so for the application of my synthesis, here are some of the specific things I found by um, applying that. First, I found that Lee provided law students with real-world context by integrating her own personal experiences and real historical events from the South into her novel. So I didn't know until I started researching this book that there are a lot, there's a lot of autobiographical information from Harper Lee. So Scout is actually a reflection of herself and Atticus Finch is actually um, very reminiscent of Harper Lee's father. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, and then the real historical events, um, the trial of Tom Robinson actually has a lot of similarities to several other real court cases that took place during this time period. So there are a lot of connections to real life things that law students can use to gain a context from this time period. Um, and then next, Lee humanizes law students by displaying strong morals in the character Atticus Finch. Um, as I mentioned in the background, um, Atticus Finch does the right thing, not the easy thing, by deciding to defend Tom Robinson. And so by emulating these strong ethics that Atticus Finch displays, uh, law students can strengthen their own moral code, which is very important in their field. And then finally, law students can learn the ethical limitations of cross-examinations. There is a part in To Kill a Mockingbird where um, Atticus Finch is cross-examining Mayela Elwell, who is the false accuser of Tom Robinson. And he does it very gently and very politely using um, his strong morals. And so by emulating that, law students can strengthen their cross-examinations because he's effective, but he also appeals to the jury by doing it kindly. And then the next book that I'm going to talk about is In Cold Blood. Um, so some background on In Cold Blood is that it is about the investigation and circumstances surrounding the quadruple homicide of the Clutter family. And so the legal theme in this book is that it is a cultural representation of the legal system in action. So this book is based on an actual crime, on the actual homicide of the Clutter family um, and so Capote goes and investigates this himself and gathers a bunch of different sources and puts it all into this narrative in cold blood. And so as a reader, you get to see the legal system from the very beginning, from before the crime is even committed all the way up until the death penalty is carried out on the criminals. Um, and so for the application of specific results for this book, Capote provides law students with real world context by basing his work off of a real life crime. So as I mentioned, this the murder of the Clutter family actually did happen and you can see a lot of truth about the legal system because of all of the different sources Capote uses because when he went and investigated this and used this, it's almost a type of literary journalism in this book, he gathered a bunch of different sources and so law students can really get a full picture of the legal system um, and gain context in this way. And then next, Capote's depiction of the killers can humanize law students as Capote invokes peeling, feelings of pity and sympathy for the killers. Um, so it was a little surprising to me as I read through that I actually felt bad for the killers. These people who murdered an entire family who was completely innocent, you don't expect that. But Capote does a great job invoking these emotions. And so by doing so, specifically for law students, he can remind them that there is a human side to everyone, which sometimes it can be easy to forget, especially when you're dealing with criminals. Um, and then Capote's storytelling uh, can also serve as a model for opening and closing statements and the ethical, and there are also ethical limitations of this method. Um, so 
by gathering all of these variety of sources, this is similar to what a lawyer would do, gathering all of his information, all of his facts, and he presents it in this one compelling and persuasive narrative. Capote is going to get you to feel pity for the killers. He's going to get you to feel what you want to feel. So by utilizing these literary techniques, uh, lawyers can strengthen their opening and closing statements. However, unlike Capote, they do have some stronger ethical limitations because law students have an obligation to the truth, which Capote can manipulate a little bit to whatever benefits his story, whereas law students in their opening and closing statements cannot. Um, and so then my next book is Billy Bud Sailor. So some background on this book is that it describes the apparent crimes of Billy Budd and John Claggart and the difficult decision that Captain Edward Vere has to make as a result. And so the legal theme in this one, like To Kill a Mockingbird, is that the law does not always result in justice. Um, and so you see this in Captain Vare's decision. He has to make a difficult decision so John Claggart falsely accuses Billy Budd of mutiny. And in response to these outrageous claims, because Billy Budd was not involved in any way in a mutiny, he strikes Claggart and kills him accidentally. And so Edward Vare has to make the decision of whether or not he wants to hold Billy Budd accountable for the murder of John Claggart. He decides to do so and hangs Billy Budd for his crimes and Captain Edward Vare is left um, all the way up to the end of the book. You feel how much he regrets his decision and you can see how much having to make such a hard decision impacts him. Um, and so the law does not always result in justice. It didn't result in justice in this case for Billy Budd, who was falsely accused, or for Captain Vare, the decision maker in this case. Uh, and for my application of my synthesis to this book, um, I found that Melville provided law students with real world context through setting and context um, under which he wrote Billy Budd Sailor. So Melville, gave law students context through the setting. So this book was set in a historically mutinous period. Um, there were a lot of successful mutinies happening around when this voyage was supposed to be taking place. So that provides law students with context on Captain Vare's decision. He was scared of mutiny. Um, so when John Claggart brought these claims, he gave them life even though there was no evidence to substantiate them because of this fear. So this provides context to his decision making there. And then also, this whole story is based on real tales at sea. Um, there was a magazine article that came out right before Herman Melville wrote this talking about the story of Billy Budd at sea. But in that magazine article, it actually portrays Billy Budd as a murderous, horrible person. So it was interesting to see Herman Melville's take on this. And then for the second part of the application of my synthesis, ethical contemplations between natural law and man-made law in Billy Budd Sailor can humanize law students. So um, natural law is the intrinsic human values that we all share, and then man-made law are the created rules of a society. So these these were really what Captain Vare had to take into account when he made the decision on whether or not he was going to uphold the law with Billy and hang him or let him go free and return to his work. Um, and so ultimately, Captain Vare sided with man-made law by hanging Billy, but we see that he regrets this decision. So this just can help law students by understanding that there is place for both of these in their work. And then my final book is Walden 2. And so a little bit about Walden 2. It is a utopian novel set in a post-World War II world. Um, and the book is essentially just talking about life at this utopian Walden 2 community. And so the legal theme in this book is that it critiques contemporary law. Um, the majority of this book is talking about Walden 2, who favors more with a fascist type of law. Those are the rules that they have at that community in comparison with the actual democratic rules of and laws of our society. 
Um, and so for my appli the application of my synthesis to this book, I found that there's real world context present in these circumstances that Skinner is responding to. So Skinner's dissatisfaction with the government when he wrote this book was a very real thing that others felt during this time period as well. So law students can understand that and gain context on this time period. And then Skinner also reveals ethics in the law to law students by incorporating moral discussions on the intersection between free will and the law. Um, and so most of this book, as I said, is just conversations between characters talking about the law at Walden II and the law in actual society. And ties into the law. And so by seeing this, law students can understand um, that they have an ethical obligation to help the people that they're representing by upholding the law and therefore in the rules of a democratic society, their free will as compared to if they would be upholding fascist law. Um, and then, so finally, overall, I found that by reading literature possessing legal themes, law students can better prepare themselves for the ethical and professional demands of their legal career. Um, for myself personally, as a student going into the legal field, um, I found myself learning a lot about the ethical situations that I had no idea that I could one day find myself in. And so by seeing what other characters and had gone through, I feel like I learned a lot about what is the right thing to do. And then also the context is important too for if I was ever working a specific case related to that time period. And that's all. Okay. Questions? Yes, Professor Clegg. Um, I think I asked you this at Showcase Day last year. Did you avoid Grisham, <laughs> <laughs> especially a time to kill, because he's so ubiquitous? Or did you decide that these were more appropriate for your topic? I mean, I really appreciate his cold blood. That's a fascinating story and a great writer, a bit of writing. But uh, I was just curious as to strength of will not to use <laughs> or um, so all of these books that I chose were actually um, on a list when I first came across all these books they were on a list specifically being recommended for first year law students to read before they came into law school so I thought that was interesting that a law professor had come out with this whole list and so then I researched a little more you know why, why were these books so important and I found that they were all actually backed by law and literature. Um, there's this thing called the great books approach, and these were all uh, supported under this approach, and so that's why I ended up really sticking with those. Not that Grisham is not interesting. <laughs> yes, Professor Sistrom. They're probably just jealous because he makes more money than all of us. <laughs> Honestly. Um, well, that, that was, I couldn't help but notice, but it made sense you would focus on what we traditionally think of as more classic literature, but um, three of the four became films. Do you think, would it make a difference studying the film version or, or law students studying it? And as a, you sort of anticipated my question, as a matter of curriculum, how would you see this getting worked into a, into a law curriculum? Just common reading for them to do before they get there, or an actual course or set of courses that law students would, would engage in literature as they're learning law? Um, I think that it would be more beneficial for them to read before they get there, but I definitely think that law and literature um, as a movement has a place in law school. And they're actually, it's something I looked for when I was looking at law schools, but all of the law schools I apply to have courses on law and literature. And so I hope I get to take one. I'm excited to take one. But I do think that there's a place in the curriculum as well. And what was your first question? The, the three of the four of them people are probably now just not more familiar with the film version of those stories. And I wonder if you think that would make a difference in the impact of a, of a law student with the visual dramatization of courtroom scenes and things like that. Um, I think that 
seeing the film in addition to reading the book can definitely help, but I just don't think that you would feel those situations as strongly or relate to the characters quite as much if you didn't read the book. I'm a big believer in the book is better than the movie, so mm -hmm. it's probably biased there. We have time for one more question. Yes. Yeah, uh, first of all, great presentation. Um, I mean, I think so. I think that people write books that give context to everything. So I think there's definitely a book that's been written about a specific business situation that can give a business scholar insight into a problem that he might himself find himself in one day. And then for engineering, I'm sure something's been written about an engineering crisis or some issue in engineering that they can learn a lot more about by gaining context. It's really hard for people to put themselves out of their own um, perspective. So by reading literature, they can really see things from other people's point of view, and I think that's just why literature is so great. Brittany, I'll just finish one more thing. It's not a question. Uh, Keely, you have some feedback online. Uh, Karen Atwater says, well done, Keely, exclamation point. And Michelle Plaisant says, nicely done, exclamation point, exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might want to know that. Great job. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Alice from the Um I met Mary Lowe in the sophomore honors history course. Uh, she was very in attuned to the pressing issue marring our, pres our present narrative. Thus, she opted to take on a devastating reality, the instances of mass murder in the United States. The resulting thesis, Mass Murder in Context, a socio-historical analysis of violence from 2012 to 2019, gives us a chilling interpretation of our current reality and challenges. Difficult to study and difficult to discuss, she approaches this work with the talent of a seasoned academician. So congratulations, Mary. Thank you. Okay, so like she said, my name's Mary Lowe. Um, I am a political science, sociology, and criminal justice major. So that's kind of why I have <laughs> chose to go with this topic. Um, so my presentation is called um, Mass Murder in Context, a Socio-Historical Analysis of Violence in the United States from 2012 to 2019. Um, I'm going to start off by introducing the relevance of my topic, uh, why I chose to study it myself. I'll then introduce some key definitions and terms that I needed to um, continue on with this research. I'll then go through the method and then the things I found as a result. I'll then conclude um, with more findings. So, although the notion of mass murder is not new, we hear about it all the time, the frequency and magnitude of this is um, expanding, it's growing, increasing at a fast pace. So this graph, let's see if I can get it, yeah. So this graph, <laughs> you can see here, this is the number of deaths from the year 1924. We just started at a, a long time ago, and then up to now, the deaths has increased at a exponential rate. And then events, you can see it a little smaller, but it is increasing over time. Um, so what I want to show um, 
I, my question is why? Why is this happening? Um, so, um, mass murder is a topic that has been broadly studied by scholars. They, uh, there's little consensus, however, on individual motivation and societal motivation. Policymakers in the media tend to focus on two While mental illness has always been around, it, um, it's something that it's always been around in the past, and if anything, the recognition and treatment of mental illness has only gotten better. The same thing with gun legislation. Guns have been around since, I don't know, the Second Amendment, um, way before that, too. And so those two things have always been around. But as we can see from my past chart, the relevance, um, the number is increasing. So my question is, is there a third factor that is causing this increase other than mental illness and gun control? So this, um, this is a chart I used in, a, in an attempt to triangulate this question. Um, so I argue that there's socio-historical context involved to also motivate these events of mass murder. So, for the purpose of this research, I needed to define mass murder. So many scholars have come up with their own definitions of mass murder, and they generally agree on the same things. But there is some um, controversy on how many um, murders or killings constitute a mass murder. So for the purpose of my project, I decided that the homicide of four or more individuals constitutes a mass murder during a brief time period in a single location by one or more perpetrators. And I did this because um, I had a kind of short, shorter time period. If I had decreased it a little lower, the, the pool would have been much, much larger. Um, also, it's important to note that in my research, I have excluded acts of domestic terrorism, international terrorism, and then acts of like law enforcement by police officers. Socio-historical context. This is the key definition for my thesis. Um, so socio-historical context is defined as it's the events that occur during a certain time period. So it looks at factors like economics, politics, war, cultural shifts, um, any events that happen that could um, these mass murder events. So for the sake of time and that big data pool, I decided to narrow down the research into three main factors, economics, politics, and the culture of violence um, within societies. Like, is there a lot of violence happening in societies? So I, for my methods, I started um, creating a base um, 1770 to 2012. This doesn't show quite to 1770 because they're kind of more scarce back then. Um, so I just listed the date, number of casualties, the year, location, all of those things. And then I use this to establish the relevance we can see that it's increasing, it's relevant. Um, and then I also used it to establish constants such as mental health. Like we know mental health is a something that's always gone on. So I decided to start on December 14th, 2012. A lot of us remember this. This is the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting. Um, this event, 20 children and six teachers were killed by Adam Lanza, he was a 20-year-old white male. Um, he had a lot of mental health issues. He, the no motives may never be known. And, um, but the violent nature of this event helps, um, is a good starting point for us to see like why, what, what other motives are, are driving this mass murder, these mass murder events. Um, and so I started here. And what I did of mass murder events from 2012 to 2019 to narrow my data pool. This is just an example of the list. It goes on. 
um, but I wanted to show you how I set it up. I set it up date, location, and then deaths. I wanted to narrow it down even more. So I found and what I found was that there were four states that had more mass murder events in these years than any of the others. Texas, California, Florida, and Pennsylvania. So for the sake of time and the large data pool, I shrunk it down to these four and I wanted to study these four and the context behind um, these events. Um, and there were still quite a few events, which is sad. So for the purpose of this presentation, and the sake of time, I just focus on Texas. Um, I made another chart with just location, deaths. I included injuries to see um, the use of guns and how impactful they can be, and then the year again. So I started off by picking an event. I picked Dallas, Texas, and I studied the event. I studied the media. I studied the demographics. So for the demographics, I wanted to look and see, um, is there any discrepancies in race? Is there any big gaps? So I looked, and I knew that Texas has a high Hispanic population. And so I looked, and I saw that there is a very high percentage of Hispanics or Latinos in Dallas, Texas, um, more so than white people. And we know that white males are typically the ones who are committing these mass murders. So I looked at this and I wanted to see, was this an event where perhaps a white male was targeting Hispanics or someone of a race? And what I found was really interesting. So the context of my events. One day before the Dallas shooting, um, there were two instances of police violence in the United States. The shooting of Alton Sterling and then the shooting of Philando Castile by police. So these were both black men and the police were both white men. And so on Obama, he addressed the people and he says, this, is, this can't happen, police brutality can't happen. That very same day he addressed the people, um, the Dallas shooter attends a rally where they're rallying against, or rioting against police brutality, and he specifically aims to kill white police officers, and he's successful in doing that. He kills five of them. There's a suspect in Baton Rouge who shoots and kills three white police officers with the same motive. So this is a good example of the context of violence and politics that I found motivated these mass murder events. So we had, um, we had police brutality going on, those were already violent events, and then they sparked these other events. Another good example is in El Paso, Texas in 2019. see that there's a high Hispanic or Latino origin of race, and this is white alone. So the last one, it was a little different because we were dealing with African Americans and Caucasians. This one I wanted to see, okay, is that the same case or is there a difference? And in this one, I found that the case of this, a 21-year-old white male showed up to a Walmart in El Paso and he was just targeting Hispanics. So he killed 22 people, he injured 26 people, and so earlier he had ranted about the invasions of um, Hispanics into Texas and the United States. And so what I'm arguing is that during that time period, there has been a big upheaval about the border um, around the US and Mexico. Donald Trump had released many statements about um, about this border wall. He, in February, he actually shut down um, about this border wall. He, in February, he actually shut down.
the that so another another um, event I studied was Fort Hood 2014. like what's going on there and I found out that it was kind of kind of a dead end I found out he had a lot of mental health issues he'd been um, examined for PTSD and he was from Puerto Rico so he wasn't targeting anyone specific he just had a lot of mental health issues and I think um, he just snapped so this is a good example of those other three or other two parts down at the bottom, gun legislation and mental health. Another similar example is Sutherland Springs, Texas, where a gunman went into a church and he killed 26 people. Um, you would think that maybe that was more racially motivated or um, an act of domestic terrorism, but in reality, he was just very mentally ill and he had had um, misdemeanors before, and he was not allowed to own guns, but for some reason, his misdemeanor did not get placed into the system, and he was able to just legally purchase guns. And so this is more of a case of gun legislation failing and mental health involved, um, not so much sparked by any context in society. So. This is how I kind of organized my sample of findings. So I went through each, each event and I determined whether or not they had um, economics involved, politics, culture of violence, mental illness, race. As you can see, they all had mental illness involved. That's, that's always gonna be there. Um, not all of them have race involved, but what I did was when I, when I saw that race was involved or any of these others, I went through to the history of that time period, what was happening in the spring of 2014 that could have motivated these events. And that, that's when I found, um, ultimately, that while the majority of these people suffered from mental illness and that gun legislation is in fact a problem, um, a lot of them were motivated by political events or movements that happened within that given time period, like in Dallas, Texas, and El Paso. So the culture of violence um, with police brutality and other movements has also motivated and inspired many to commit similar acts. Um, I didn't talk about my other ones because for time purposes, but I found some more um, more findings that I'm not gonna talk about in my thesis, but I found them interesting, and so I wanted to put them up here. So I went through and I looked and I wanted to see, um, are there any months that are most popular for mass murder shootings? And what I found was that the summer months seem to be higher than those in the lower months. And so potentially for future studies, I could study why um, why this is, why there are more, more events happening in May, June, July than any of the others. Um, but for the purpose of this, this project, I just focused on the socio-historical context in those four states. Thank you, any questions?
So yeah, um, to answer the first question about expanding my database, it started out huge. Um, it started out really big, and then I narrowed it down to 2012 to 2019, and I still got about 70 events that I would have to comb through from motives. And um, so then I decided I wanted to narrow it down even more just to kind of find that context. But yes, I feel like it would be um, a more interesting project to reach it out and and go through that but for the sake of time and um, my two years I did um, narrow it down um, also to the mental health and gun legislation that would be like a personal preference I more I didn't study those I didn't study mental health I didn't study whether or not we need gun legislation um, and so I feel like I would be more equipped to answer that if I focus my study on that but I focus more of the societal um, context behind everything. Just a follow-up, if I'm not mistaken, I think I saw this statistic in one year ago. If you include four deaths as the minimum for a mass murder, there are six to eight such examples every week in the literature. Uh, so we hear almost nothing about the vast majority of mass murders. But did you It did. It came up frequently. I, when looking through the long list of mass murders, I had to say, okay, this has three or this has two. And those lists are considerably bigger. And it would take longer, sadly, than two years to, to comb through all of those events if I would have um, dropped it down to two or three or a certain amount of injuries. Um, so for the purpose of this time period I've been given, this time frame, I had to narrow it down um, to a specific focus. But yes, um, there are long lists out there that constitute mass murder other than the casualties. So the number of casualties is what um, shrinks and grows the list, I guess. Yes? Like a, just a theologist, right? You're not, uh, you're not saying those other factors aren't obvious, but you're interested in this other context that, you know, what, what might spark from the mental illness to actually to be readily access to guns, but they have to have a motive in order to use them, right? And that's what you're looking for, this context. It seems, and I remember, you know, the perspective point when you were thinking about what am I going to look for in this discernible 21st century chunk of time in social, social or social context, was the effect, the kind of amplifying effect of media, that an individual shooter might be motivated by other shooters for the, for the desire to gain notoriety. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I actually, in, in many of the events that I studied and noted, there were previous events that had happened days or a week or so before, and not just the, the smaller ones, I don't want to say smaller, but the smaller number of casualties. It's the larger events have been like preceding these events, and so there could be a correlation between that um, and the media producing all of this um, news about these events, I do agree. I do think that would be um, definitely a contributing factor. I'll take them first. Yes. Well, 9-11 is considered uh, international like terrorism. And so I didn't. I excluded terrorism and domestic terrorism because um, I wanted to focus more on society in the United States, not what's going on outside of the United States and how is it coming inside, because then that would just expand it that much more. Um, and I wanted to focus and hone in on U.S. society, what's happening in the context of 
our country and how is it motivating these mass murder events? It still wouldn't have included it, yes. That's a good point. Yes. Yeah, and it's it's, very it's sad, and it's that many events can be overwhelming to study, and so especially for two years um, being in school, having to constantly study mass murder, I felt like it was better to narrow it down a little bit. I think yes. I mean, I had to look at it objectively. I was, I was doing a project. I wanted to figure out what was going on. Um, but it was definitely sad, and I've talked to Dr. Palmadesta multiple times. We, we would, she would share with me events that would happen frequently. She would just constantly send me, here's a new one that happened. And it was sad, to, and especially when I was compiling the list of, of deaths. And um, as a person, I see those as humans and not just numbers. And so, yeah, it did impact me. Um, but the findings were interesting, and I was able to kind of get a better understanding of why this is happening so frequently. If we go back over our national history, from the Pilgrim colonies to Bougainville to St. Valentine's Massacre to any decade you want to name, is this simply a characteristic? That's a <laughs> I mean because you can limit when you want to start and when you want to stop, but you can't find a period that's too early unless it's before sixteen hundred. Exactly, yeah. I mean but you do see and I do, I do agree it's it's Sadly, it's kind of part of our society, American society. People know us for all these mass shootings we've had, but we've had so many more in this this short past time period. In modern day, I mean, they were they existed back um, 1770, the Boston Massacre, all of those events. They existed, but they were more spread out, more scattered. And now it's just we had one yesterday. We have one today. We're probably going to have one next week or the day after. And then I just kind of argue why. Um, that's what my thesis argues. So, yes, I do believe it's part of our history, part of our, our culture, sadly. But here recently it's been happening in more frequency. And we still have to figure out why because what you did. And it's not just another example of cultural violence, but what on social and social context created this version of the cultural violence, right? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Can you hear her, Stephanie? Can you hear her on the mic? Oh, okay. A second delay? Okay. Should I turn it off and back on, or is that normal? Okay. There we go. Okay. There she is. 
right. Um, I met Samantha when I taught the sophomore honors history course. Um, when I had her in class, I never would have guessed that she was a math education major. Um, she had such a talent for deciphering difficult historical and philosophical texts. It just usually our math majors and honors look at me like I have six heads. So it was really you know, it, it was really interesting to get to know her. Um, she did add a history minor, um, so I was able to have her in class a few more times. Uh, she's a great student, is passionate about confronting inequities in our world, and will do so in her own classroom very soon. Her thesis, Bias in Mathematical Word Problems, demonstrates the depth and reach of racial and socioeconomic inequities in our education system, drilling into the seemingly harmless word problems in a typical high school algebra class. I am very proud of what she has accomplished, and I am so glad that she is taking her fire and dedication to the classroom. Okay. One second, let me see how this works. Okay, good. Okay, so this is a little more interactive, so please actually talk. <laughs> that might be nice. <laughs> You're gonna, you guys are going to be just like my high school students. Okay, so I'm Samantha. Um, this is my thesis, Bias in Mathematical Word Problems, and my wonderful advisor, Dr. Palmadessa. So I want you to read this question and tell me what things you have to know to be able to even start answering this. And you can raise your hand, speak out, whatever makes you feel good. So you need to know how many cards are in a deck of cards. What else? <laughs> well, yes, you might want to know what a magic show is. Anything else? How many queens there are? And then the actual math part, which is the probability, right? So you actually need to know two out of the three things you need to know are not even related to math. So in a classroom, this is harmless. I can say, OK, you don't look, look like you know what's going on, so maybe I need to give you some more information. But on a test, a multiple choice, I can just say you don't know what probability is, but in reality you might, I really hate this question by the way, <laughs> you might just not know what, how many cards are a deck of cards. Um, and that can be very problematic when we start making assumptions about groups of people. We might say 50% of our male minority students don't know what probability is, when in reality they haven't played cards because they have an iPhone, right? So these were the research questions that came from that. So I talked about content and linguistic bias if it's present in traditional public schools and are teacher, teachers actively addressing that bias in their own word problems. So two important vocabulary words that I have from my research are content bias and linguistic bias. They're, they can be used interchangeably, but content bias focus more on like cultural choices you have, um, obviously the content, right? And then linguistic bias focuses on the word choice you have in those word problems. So I have two questions here. The first question is from a study done by Susan Bosher. It's called Barriers to Creating a More Culturally Diverse Nursing, Pro um, nursing Profession. This is actually the best um, research I had. This was so close to what I want to do, but it was about nursing. So go ahead and read this question. And I just want someone to tell me what you think the answer might be. Again, like I know you guys aren't all nursing people, and I'm not a nursing person <laughs> either. So I just want to know what you guys think. You think it's C? And why do you think that? Or you just guessed? <laughs> yeah, so it's really interesting. I thought this was a really great question. Um, so for someone like American, right, we might think of tomato soup as something like maybe salty, right? Some people think of tomato soup as really salty. So they saw that a lot of um, Americans chose beef, like a patty of beef, not necessarily a hamburger, right? Just beef and some potatoes, while a lot of international students chose the tossed salad. And some people do think of tomato soup as like a lighter, less sodium-filled thing. Um, I thought it was, this question was funny because in Jamaica, a beef patty is like a turnover, really salty, and I would not give to someone who has a low-sodium diet. So again, this question is something that discussion-wise is not harmful, but if I'm going to make an assumption of whether or not you're a good nurse off this question, it can be very harmful in that context. OK, go ahead and read the next question. And I want you to tell me what words jump out, of, out at you based on what we've been talking about. Yes. Blouse. <laughs> Anything else? Any? Flats, right? So. 
this problem is interesting because you don't necessarily need to know what those words mean to solve it, right? But I'm thinking about kids who don't like math and don't want to be taking this assessment right now. And they see this question and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about, so I'm going to skip this one and we're going to be done with this. Um, so yes, blouse and flats are not difficult words, but is it really necessary? Like, can you just say a shirt and some shoes? Like, you don't need to make it so complicated when the focus is can you write a linear equation? So as a teacher, sometimes I have to ask myself, what am I actually testing? Do I want to know whether or not they know what a clothing name is, or do I just want to know if they can do the math? So these were my methods. So I had four surveys. I only listed three of them. But my first one was a demographic survey. Um, so I would ask some questions about their educational background. Do they go to mostly? Um, majority white schools and majority minority schools. Um, I did collect five word problems from them that they would, do, they would put on an assessment for their students. They then had to answer questions about those word problems. So they might talk about if they use student names in those word problems, what um, research have they done about these issues? Have they taken any classes about these kind of things? And then finally, I didn't really tell them what this was about because it kind of defeats the purpose, right? So they got some information about the study and then could add ask questions or add anything they wanted to, you know, in terms of what they thought doing the process. Go ahead and read. <laughs> Go ahead and start with the first one. So these are actually word problems I collected. And just read the first one and again, look at the demographics. So this was from a white male who um, most of his education was from majority white populations and his classroom is around 40 to 60% minority. So what do you think made me think there was a problem with this question? Huh? A loan from the bank. So for college students, we probably know what a loan is, right? Because it's a lot of money. But in terms of solving this math problem, I have to know which is a fixed amount and which is something that changes monthly. Even if I know something alone is associated with money, I might not know it's a set amount of money I get from the bank. So I wouldn't be able to solve this just off that assumption, right? When normally, for us, we can say the $9,000 is something that's not changing every month, so that's my loan. What about this one? Anyone? Caterer? Um, so this one was interesting because in her rationale she talked about that parties was something her students were interested in. Um, so that was her reason for creating that. Um, but culturally, I know for me, everyone brings food. <laughs> you don't hire a caterer, right? I mean, not in terms of the parties I've been to. So this one was also something that's just, again, do you need to know what a caterer is to solve this? No, but if I, for example, let's go back actually. When I see that word, ventricle septal deficit, I'm like, oh, this is out of my alley. I'm going to move on, right? So the same thing happens to our kids. When they read that, they're like, I don't know what this is. They're assuming they should know what it is, right? Because a lot of them don't have that test readiness, that test literacy. So they see this and go, I don't know math. I don't know what the hell that is. I'm moving on and I'm done with it, right? So some other topics that are interesting that other teachers brought up to me. A lot of our kids are new to the country, they're ELL. They don't have IDs to get loans from the bank, right? Just things you don't think about. Um, again, low-income students, are they getting a caterer to a party? No. You cook some food, invite your friends over and call it a day. So in talking in general, the literature I found pretty much agrees that testing in general does not render results that represent all our populations. Making general assessments based on those testings is really dangerous and detrimental to our min minority students. One thing I read from Apple in ide Ideology and Curriculum is that schools recreate consciousness in our society. So if I make a statement that minority students don't do well on Math 1, as a student who's a minority student, what do you think that makes you think, right? It makes you think that, and then as teachers, when we see a minority kid walk in our class, we may automatically make that assumption, even if we try to stop ourselves. So again, these are very dangerous. And <laughs> this quote I really like, too, from Beverly Tatum. 
It says, she then adds, if we live in America, we are racism breathers, and it doesn't matter what color we are. We don't try to be. We aren't conscious of the racism we breathe. And, he, and she was talking about racism as in smog. You know, you, don't, you see the smog or you don't see the smog. You breathe it in, and you don't think anything of it, right? OK, let me see how much time I got, because I have more examples. All righty. OK, I'm going to do one more. Here's another one. This one's so fun. So this question is about some stuff I don't know about. But the word here is Tums. I was like, Tums, that's a great question. Tums are an American brand name. So if you try to translate this as someone who doesn't speak English that well, you wouldn't really be able to figure this out because you don't know what Tums are. You don't know what um, things are in there, calcium chloride, that kind of stuff, right? So this question was really interesting as well. Another one was. This one. Answer choice C. Does anyone know what that word is? I don't want you to explain it out loud. But, <laughs> but a lot of times we do this too, is the questions we do in class are really simple. And then the questions we get them on the test, we use a word that we never used before. So even though for me, my mom's a teacher, and I kind of know how to do multiple choice tests, right? You circle the one you think it might be, you eliminate choices. You're looking for something, and you don't know what that is. You're like, oh, not that answer. So I think in general, it's just important that even though it might not seem like a big deal, we really do use the results of our assessments really seriously, and we do make generalizations about groups of students based on those assessments. So especially multiple choice questions where you can't tell, did they guess? Do they not know this piece of information? Do they not know how many cards are a deck of cards? It can be very interesting. Um, and I thought it was very interesting to study this. OK, all done. <laughs> OK, questions? Yes. Yeah. If you wanted to study, you couldn't really study that test result. So how, how do you think you might? And the second, I assume, assumption is that the bias that the teachers who are writing their own questions are getting in the question bank, that is they're, they're innocent. They don't, they're not intending to be biased. So how do you fix that with math educators uh, to help them be more confident in the questions they write? So the biggest thing I found in my research in terms of strategies to prevent this or to help this is personalization or student interest. So like in the other example, when she was talking about the party, she heard conversations with her kids that they were having a party. So she's under the assumption that by making this problem interesting, those students are now going to be able to say, well, I have a party. I'm, I can actually access this question, right? But then you know, the, the word comes in that might make it a little bit more challenging. So I think two things that can be helped is one, more of this method, right? You use, you know, you have a kid named Sam in your class, so you put that name in your, in whatever assignment you have, right? Um, and then there's not a lot of um, classes that teachers go to that has to do with this issue. So of course, just education on the subject in general. And I think that I, as a student teacher now, I do some of this sometimes without even realizing it. And if I wasn't studying it, I would never think of anything of it, right? But I literally have to ask myself, what are they going to get stuck on? <laughs> and is any of it relevant to what I'm actually assessing? And so if you have that, even just know about this, and you look, look through that lens, it helps you make sure that what I'm actually assessing is the main goal. Um, an example of this is we were doing rational expressions with my students. And for my honor students, they have to factor and then do the adding. For my standard, I have it factored. So I can know that they actually know how to add. And it's not that they don't know how to factor, right? So it's just trying. It's, they call it an access point to the question. You come over and you get them started, right? And so by having that lens and actually questioning your own teaching, I think that they'll be able to mitigate some of these issues. Yeah.
Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. By the assumptions, this these presenter makes to those to whom he or she is presenting. And also, it seems to fall in line some of the issues that Natasha Myers is bringing up now with uh, implicit racism, for lack of a better word, yeah. uh, in our overall society, and which is embedded in our most basic. That made me think of this problem, actually, if you don't mind me going over it. Um, me and my mentor teacher were talking about this problem, and she made the um, statement that in her school, like she used to have kids bring in deck of cards and they would play, which, you know, you know that now kids have phones and stuff like that, they don't do it. But another thing that was funny is all the games I played with my family were like you pick a set of cards, like all the fours, all the queens, all the whatever. I never played spades or blackjack or anything with a full set of cards, which is why this question used to piss me off every time I would see it because even though I played cards, I didn't play full decks of cards. I played war or something. You know what I mean? I'm not counting how many cards in our deck of cards. So even though you might think everyone plays cards, even the way we play it, can, like you said, it seems like we have these things in common, but in reality, there's so many differences between the groups. Yes? I think that in a different year, I might have, but in COVID, it was like, here's my stuff, see you later kind of thing. Um, but I do think that even just talking to my mentor teacher um, who taught this class a lot, um, she was able to even point out things I didn't notice, someone who's looking through that lens. And so I think that in general, that, and kind of like Clegg was talking about, there's no ill will here. It's just that the more, and the more you know your students is the more you can create things like that. I'm honestly less concerned about the tests teachers are making than I'm concerned about overall standardized testing, right? Um, the ones that come from Texas, we're talking about Texas again, that, you know, I'm like, we took, we're talking about the same math class, right? Because I've never seen a problem like this. Um, those are the ones I'm more concerned about, but I think that even seeing these, I mean, this is in the same school. This is from people across the hall from each other. Um, we're all sitting in the same hallway and we can still see things like this um, from, a first-year math teacher from a five-year math teacher and talking to a 27-year math teacher. Um, so if we can see differences like this from those types of teachers who I know are really loving and care about their students, imagine from someone who's getting paid to write a test for the whole entire country. I know. I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think too, like, um, it's kind of a, I, f I see it like a cycle. You're a first year teacher, you're closer in age to your students, you are more attentive to those kind of things versus like one day I didn't have a problem ready. I just grabbed one from her little book. I'm not reading whether or not my kids are interested in it. I need, I have class in five minutes, you know what I mean? So I think there's a little bit of a cycle between a first year teacher versus very long term teachers. Some of them, like my teacher, super attentive to those things and edits her stuff over time. While others, if it worked, why am I gonna fix it? Um, but I think your point that as we're starting to include more of these um, trainings and stuff like that in there, hopefully even just knowing that this is here and this is a thing, that we can become more aware of it and fix these problems. Yes? We have an online question. Um, yes. Processes of 
getting loans or filing taxes? Yes, and I'm sure if you do a quick Google search, <laughs> you'll see lots about that. Um, and again, like what I'm going to pull my quote back up from my research when I did um, Apple ideology and curriculum and then Jan, uh, Jean Annion and social class and her hidden curriculum is that a lot of times, like let's say a loan, you're producing, if, if you're thinking about student interest, you're producing something that you think those students will have to deal with later in life. So we're assuming a certain type of lifestyle or social class for certain groups of students and it's like, it's shown so much in the future, I mean, in other things, like you said, getting a loan from the bank. I mean, it's proven that based on your race you check, th there used to be that your different interest rates would change. You know what I mean? Like those things are, in a society that we really care about money, <laughs> we're gonna find a way to, to make, we really think about everything we do. And when racism was okay, it's prevalent in everything, is all I'm gonna say, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it was really disproportionate with ACT because many of those families really had no idea that they were signing up on it, especially the time of layoff. Yep. It was coming and they had to afford it. And I think Naomi Jane Simon is a good example of that. Yeah. And I think, too, you're never going to know everything about someone or about a culture. It's impossible. And even all of this is assumptions, right? There could be a full group of students who all can afford a caterer, right? So I'm even making assumptions saying that. Um, but the thing that sparked this is Dr. Kaysen, who you guys probably know, I was working with her for the Supplemental Instruction Program, and she was telling me a story about she had a group of minority kids, right, who were lower income, and she did a problem about writing checks. And the kids were like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. She looked up the background of those parents, and all of them worked in factories and literally got handed an envelope with cash. You're not thinking your problem is racist, but it's just like, if you don't really think about or research what's going on in your kid's life, you make the assumption that everyone knows what a check is. When all of these parents, don't, they don't trust the banks, you know what I mean? They're not going to put their money in the bank. They barely have money left over. So that was really the eye-opening thing for me. Yes? That's funny. Yes. So on this page, when I said I had four, the last one's called the final survey. It was just an excerpt from my uh, perspective with basically saying all these things I just talked about and then asking, do you have any concerns, questions like that? But they were told after the fact, which is why I made you guys do the word problem before I told you what my research questions were. I thought it was fitting. Did you want to say your question, Dr. Sistrom? Cheat, cheat. Oh, Lord. <laughs> So if I really hated myself, I would do a study on how these kind of assumptions that we make about students and students uh, self-image themselves on their mental health and how they perform on math problems. That was something as I was showering this morning I was thinking about was the fact that, wow, if I knew that everyone thought black people tested bad on math problems and I thought I tested bad on math problems, that that's just gonna be a chip on my shoulder for the rest of my life kind of thing. And I even know for me that one of the reasons I'm so outspoken is because I feel that people already have a perceived image of me. So I feel like I need to like be the person talking to break through those images. So if I really wanted to spend the rest of my life on that, that would be one. The other thing would just to be to closely follow a classroom, um, do this kind of study, then edit the problems and see how that's pushing barriers with those children and you know, in that sense. Okay, thank you so much. That's right, she is so good.
Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Chelsea Douglas. She's a biology major, a chemistry humanities um, minor, and she is currently our SIP, our supplemental instructor in general biology. She um, picked this research kind of as maybe like a little bit of a Um, and I think that she has learned through this SIP and through this process that she would like to try to pursue education. So she's going to join our PAL program and become a high school educator after graduation. Okay, so the title of my project is a discussion of sexual education. I started looking for a topic I was really interested in women's health and so I knew I wanted to do something um, surrounding that and so as I was researching women's health I came across a TED talk by Melinda Gates and she was talking about um, the importance of contraception and how that relates to poverty and her organization Contraception is the number one anti-poverty tool for women. And so as I was researching contraception and how that relates to poverty, I came across how um, contraception and sex education relate and how sex education at an early age is critical for um, the rest of your life as a woman. And so these are some interesting statistics I came across. Um, firstly, there's 750,000 adolescent pregnancies in the United States each year. And of course, some of these are intended, but an overwhelming majority are unintended pregnancies. Nearly half of all high school students report having sexual intercourse, and so that could be one time or multiple times. 90% of teens reported using some form of contraception the last time they had sex, according to the CDC. And this is a good thing, but most of them use short-term contraception. And short-term contraception is, for example, male condoms, female condoms, and birth control pills. And it's really better if they use long-acting reversible contraception, which is like an IUD or an exponent implant. And that's because long-acting reversible contraception has a higher efficacy rate and less room for user error. You don't have to remember to take a pill and you can't mess up the mechanics of long-acting contraception. And so increasing access and awareness about long-acting reversible contraception is one way to reduce teen pregnancy. And so some controversy surrounding sex education, firstly is abstinence. Um, a lot of parents or community push when it comes to teens and having sex that could be on the basis of the contraception and knowledge about contraception and so some may think that um, providing comprehensive sex education is condoning teenage sex but focus a focus on education with safe sex content does not condone teenagers having sex and Teenagers don't need parental consent to have sex, therefore they shouldn't need parental consent to have safe sex. And so in the United States, only 24 states and D.C. mandate sex education for youth. 37 states require that when sex education is taught, it must include abstinence. And 26 of those 37 states require that abstinence must be stressed. Only 13 states require that the information being taught in sex education be medically accurate when sex education is being taught, information on contraception must be provided. And so this is a study I found that's for illustrating the importance of early education about contraception and sexual health. And so researchers um, followed a group of 6,662 sexually active young women from 1995 to 2008, and they asked them questions about contraceptives and sexual health. And they found that those who had positive views about contraception at a young age were more likely to use contraception as an adult. And so some potential discrepancies in education, one factor can be region. So different states have different requirements. Um, 
a student in Virginia versus a student in North Carolina can have completely different sex education experiences. Another factor is environment. And this just simply means that everybody grows up with a different home life. Someone could have parents that are really comfortable talking about sex with them, or they may not. Some students may have internet access, or they may not. And so we shouldn't assume that people are just learning about sex and safe sex at home. Um, another place for potential discrepancy is bias. And when I say bias, I mean on the part of the Maybe a teacher believes that abstinence is the best path for preventing unintended pregnancies and STDs, so they're going to spend more time covering abstinence than safe sex methods. And then um, unintentional bias could be maybe a teacher knows more about short-term contraception than long-term contraception, so they're going to spend more time on short-term contraception. And lastly, um, curriculum is another factor when it comes to discrepancies in education. There's no national sex education curriculum, and there's no statewide sex education curriculum. There are to be met, um, but they're very um, kind of basic, and there's a lot of North Carolina teaching standards for sex education. Um, essential standard one says, Understand healthy and effective interpersonal communication and relationships. Um, standard two says, evaluate abstinence from sexual intercourse as a positive choice for young people. So here you can see abstinence is being stressed. And then the third standard says, create strategies that develop and maintain reproductive and sexual health. Standards. And so this is part of the standard that said, um, develop and maintain reproductive and sexual health. So 3.3 says, illustrate skills related to safe and effective use of methods to prevent STDs, as well as access resources for testing and treatment. And 3.4 says, problem solving regarding safe and effective use of methods to prevent unintended pregnancy. And so these are the only two clarifying objectives on the list where where the supplements talk about IUDs, the teacher is left to supplement that. And so all of this led me to my project, which was two parts. Um, I conducted surveys on the Greensboro College freshman their experience with their sex education in high school, their opinions about Um, if they felt like they learned enough or not. And I also asked them questions about school nurses and guidance counselors and how they related to their sexual health topics because um, nurses and guidance counselors are two people that students can go to for those issues in schools. And for my interviews, um, I initially set out to interview because of the pandemic, it was hard to get interviews. So I interviewed two guidance counselors um, but even though it was just two interviews, I think they're really helpful and informative. And I kind of asked them the same questions, but from their perspective. So were they involved in their school sex ed curriculum? Were they aware of what was being taught in it? And um, did they feel like they had enough resources to help students in this way? And these are some research questions that I kept in mind while I did my project. So first is the information teenagers receive from health teachers, school nurses, and guidance counselors, more comprehensive or abstinence only? How do varying sexual education curriculums affect the overall knowledge and opinions teens have towards contraception? To what degree are sexual education on adolescent sexual health and are guidance counselors feeling that need? And how long how is long-acting reversible contraception portrayed by health teachers, school nurses, and guidance counselors? And so these are my sur survey results. Um, I surveyed a total of 105 students, 73 of which received sex education in a different state. Um, there were three non-binary students, 72 males and 30 females, so there was an overwhelming majority of males in the survey. 
And for the results that I continued to analyze, I focused on students who received sex education in North Carolina. Sex, 22.8% said focused on abstinence. And 38.6% said equal focus on abstinence and safe sex. And so um, you can see abstinence has a little bit of a smaller number in responses, but overall it's pretty. Um, and so this is about are students learning enough? And so the question they were asked was, what do you? plus issues, um, healthy and abusive relationships, STDs, contraception. Um, and one answer choice was, do you feel like you learned enough? And only 28% of students said they felt like they learned enough. And of that 28%, only 16% were female. And so from that, I could draw the conclusion that females maybe are feeling especially underserved in their sex ed experience. And so these next three questions are about school nurses and um, adolescent sexual health. So the first question is, did you ever visit the school nurse with concerns about sexual health? And 98% of students said no. And then the second question is, did you feel comfortable going to see the school nurse for sexual health activity related information? And 51% of students said no. And the last question is, did you find the nurse to be helpful regarding your topics of concern? And 63% of students said no. And so from these results, it seems like a majority of students find the school nurse to be unhelpful and unapproachable regarding sexual health. Students came to them with these kinds of concerns and they said probably around once a week, give or take. And I asked them if they felt like they were supported um, financially And one of the counselors even went as far as to say that there's certain things she's not allowed to counsel students about. Um, she's had students come to her pregnant and she's not allowed to tell them what plan B is. So like secretly she has to take money out of her own pocket, give them plan B because she's not supported through the school to do this. And so um, in conclusion, based on my research surveys and interviews, it seems like there's a lot of gaps in sex education that aren't currently being filled. And I think one potential solution to this could be expanding on the current essential standards that we have in North Carolina. So we discuss methods for preventing unintended pregnancy, list out the specific methods, tell teachers to cover contraception, cover condoms, cover IUDs, um, or even adding new standards. Um, one question I asked, Um, well, I think it's important to note that they found guidance counselors unhelpful and unapproachable. A majority of students found school nurses unhelpful and unapproachable. Um, several, there's several gaps in their sex ed curriculum. And so then that begs the question, where are they getting this information and who can they go to? And so I think um, establishing um, people in schools um, who that I know that they have these people and these resources if they need them is really important. So just expanding information about resources that are available to them. Yes.
find a way to see how it's practical to the community or reactive when you said, well, here's what we think about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, well, I asked students, um, and there was like kind of an open-ended question when I asked them if they would go to school nurses or guidance counselors for these issues. And uh, one of the main reasons why they didn't want to was just simply like, oh, I don't like her, or that's not her job. And so, you know, some of them just think that that's not her role. And so establishing that that is one of her jobs is important, or their jobs. Um, and also, um, guidance counselors especially uh, have several responsibilities in schools. They're supposed to counsel students about college, about mental health, among other things. And so um, a lot of times this can get pushed to the back burner. And so um, just trying to provide more resources and then letting students know that they are there for them if they need them. I think that they maybe took it for granted that students should know that, and I think several students actually didn't. Um, I didn't really look into that. Um, pretty much everything I looked at was in person sex education from what I researched. Right. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I didn't really research a lot about that. Um, I just focused more on in person classes and what was being covered there. Mm -hmm. Can you clarify for me, that was, your, was that your college interview? Or um, level? That was uh, my surveys that I conducted From at Greensboro College. College. Okay. So yeah, all of those um, charts were based on student, student responses that go to school here. Did you interview them in person or with a survey? Like um, I did a survey, so I went to each um, GCS class and I kind of just passed them out. So they were all anonymous. and. So no, I didn't see that. Um, I did some online, but the responses were not, um, there was just more responses in person. I was a little surprised, um, just because it seems like that's one of their main jobs is to counsel students. and. If um, over half of high school students are having sex, then it seems like that's something important for them to know. Um, but at the same time, I guess I could say I wasn't surprised because I know that guidance counselors are very overworked and also school nurses are very overworked. There's a shortage of school nurses right now. Some schools don't have them at all and some schools are, there's one school nurse for a county, so resources are very limited. Um, well, since abstinence is supposed to be stressed in North Carolina, I was surprised to see that um, it had a lower number of responses than um, comprehensive and then uh, just focused on safe sex did. So that was a good surprise, I guess. And um, also, I asked students what they learned, what they felt like was covered the least, and um, the main response was LGBTQ plus issues. And I'm not really surprised by that, but it was just something I didn't think to research because sex education is very heteronormative, like even all of the research I looked at on it is. So that was surprising to me. Yes, Dr. Cook. Mm-hmm. for sex education because everybody's environment and background is different and everybody might not have such a strong support system at home for that. Yeah. 
Well, I think my personal opinion about why maybe less females felt like they learned enough in my survey um, and more males so they felt like they had learned enough is because, um, you know, a lot of things you learn in sex ed are geared towards females and females are the ones who have to remember it. Like contraception, long acting contraception, maybe a guy is like, oh, I don't care about IUDs. Like that, how does that affect me? But then girls definitely um, need to learn about that because a lot of times um, the responsibility of safe sex and pregnancy can fall on the shoulders of women. Okay. Um, well, if I was going to approach accuracy, I think it would be kind of a hard project to delve into because, like I said, there's no statewide curriculum and each school can have its own curriculum. And so, you know, you would have to go um, from school to school maybe and see what they're teaching and look at that. You can't just pick out um, for North Carolina, this is what's being covered. And so um, I think that just is showing the spectrum of education that we have. Samano Romo, Christy, uh, she's a math major, minoring in humanities and business analytics. Create proofs for mathematical card tricks. She first told me about that topic. Uh, I said, Aye, good luck. I'll see you in a week when you can't find anything. <laughs> actually amazed about the, the, the depth of the topic itself and um, she has no shortage of material to investigate. Um, we did practice a couple of these tricks and found out that we, uh, we just can't count <laughs> and I'm worse, <laughs> I'm the worst one, <laughs> a little bit irrational I think but um, feel for the roots of the subject. <laughs> um, my fault. <laughs> to you, Christy. Hello, everybody. Um, the title of my thesis is Creating Proofs for Mathematical Card Tricks. And this uh, thesis idea came about after I saw some YouTube videos by this guy named Matthew Parker, who has an entire YouTube channel dedicated to showing mathematical concepts. And a lot of these mathematical concepts he shows through some really cool card tricks. And so after seeing these videos, I was really intrigued by the idea of the mathematics behind card tricks. And so here we are today. So without further ado, Okay, first I want to give you guys just a very brief history of mathematical card tricks. The first recorded report of a magical card trick appeared in Europe back in 1408. And it told a story of a man who manipulated the cards to his advantage by shuffling and splitting the decks to reveal a mysterious card as if by some magical force. Later in 1584, Reginald Scott uh, published his book, The Discovery of Witchcraft. And really, it wasn't a discovery of witchcraft. He was trying to debunk witchcraft. Um, he believed that a lot of things that people thought of as literal magic or tricks were actually well-disguised conjuring tricks. Um, So these two terms 
sometimes get mixed up um, or misused. So in the world of logic, a theorem um, is a statement that is proven to be true. And obviously, that is a very broad definition. Lots of statements could fall into that category. But in mathematics, um, a theorem is applied to more special and rare cases. So take, for example, the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I'm sure everybody remembers that. <laughs> and so theorems to mathematics, such as the Pythagorean theorem, um, aren't just statements that are shown to be true through the rules of mathematical logic, but also uh, statements that shape the world of mathematics. Um, one of the theorems that I use in my thesis is the Hall's marriage theorem, which I will get into later. Um, we also have mathematical principles. So a principle is not the same as a theorem. Um, the term principle can be applied to several uh, conceptual topics in mathematics, whereas a theorem usually denotes um, a more specific concept to a unique domain of areas in mathematics. So one of the principles that I use in my thesis is the pigeonhole principle. Um, and another more famous principle would be the inclusion-exclusion principle used in set theory and probability. So speaking of probability, some probability concepts that also get mixed up sometimes are combinations and permutations. So a combination is simply that the elements in a set do not distinguish between they're in. Take, for example, making a bowl of cereal. It doesn't matter if you put the milk or the cereal in first. It's still going to be a bowl of cereal. <laughs> Whereas um, a permutation, it does not work without order. So take, for example, the passcode to your iPhone. Unless it's the same digits repeating, it's going to matter which order you put them in. OK, so some of you might be wondering, what is a proof? So in its practical definition, a proof has, its, has a goal to convince the mathematical community of the validity of the theorem that it underlies. So some of the basic proof techniques are direct proofs, um, proofs by contradiction, proofs by contrapositive, and proofs by induction. OK, so now I will be performing the middle thirds, um, also known as the 27 card trick. So if I could ask for a volunteer from the audience that would like to come up and experience some math and magics, <laughs> just to raise your hand, or President Darda. <laughs> work. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to pick a number 1 through 27 and tell me that number. 1 through 27, number 21. 21. Okay, I'm going to ask you to write that number on the board for everybody to see. Okay, so now I'm, I'm going to um, show you the deck of cards. You're going to pick one out. You can just look at it and remember it in your head, or you could pick it out and put it back in the deck, whatever you prefer. Uh, I'll remember it. OK. So it's in here. Um, if you would like to shuffle the deck. Sure. <laughs> I'm a rather primitive shuffler. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. All right. I'm going to put these cards into three piles face up. And as I'm putting them down, I want you to look for your card. So um, just pay really good attention to as I'm putting the cards down. And when I'm finished putting, all right, I'm going to do it again. And you're going to do the
Paul, is it in now? It is in. This one again? Okay. All right. I'm going to do it one last time, and you're going to do the same thing. Okay. <laughs> This takes a while. <laughs> okay, which pile is your card in this time? Okay. No idea. Great. All right. So now you pick the number twenty one. I do. Great. So one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Then we have the threes place. Three to the first power is three. And we did not use any in that. And then we have the nines place, three squared. And that would be <clears throat> nine times two is 18, plus zero plus two gives us 20. So in this case, um, zero, one, and two represent the level that the piles are in when I pick them back up after shuffling. So the first time I picked the cards back up, I put the pile that the card was in in the bottom. So starting from 0, 0, 1, 2, 2 is the bottom. The second time I did it, I put the card that the pile that the card was in in the top, 0. And then the last time I put the card, the pile that the card was in at the bottom again. So that is slowly shuffling the cards to give us the chosen card in the 21st position in the final deck. Yeah, it, so that works out um, because it was, and because you pick such a high number, 21, it w would end up being in the last pile every time. Um, that's how the shuffle turns out. But a lot of time, most of the time they they end up being like in different piles. Okay, so this is just a chart showing all the different possible combinations for um, an audience member picking a number one through 27. So if you don't wanna do the math, you could always try to memorize this, <laughs> which I think would be a lot more difficult, but I don't know, maybe you have a photographic memory, so. Um, this is the proof that I created for the card trick. Um, we define K as a secret card. Um, we get somebody to pick N and then take N minus 1, 0 through 26. Um, so then we will have a unique set of three ordered numbers where the, where the pile of the secret card is is moved after every I shuffle, I going from 0, 1, 2. Um, after three shuffles are completed, the secret card K We'll hold the nth position in the final deck with n minus 1 cards on top of it, as I explained. And so this is the equation that I was able to come up with that satisfies um, the trick for any of its combinations. Okay. So up next, we have Fitch Cheney's five card trick. This trick first appeared as the Because the original trick, the um, spectator is asked to bring his own shuffle deck and then uh, pick out five cards. And then the uh, person performing would put four face up and one face down, which is the same as a hand of, at, of stud poker. So it would look something like this. Um, and this would be the hidden card that I am going to try to guess. 
So now um, here I have a deck of 52 cards. And I'm going to ask Dr. Davidson to shuffle them and pick somebody from the audience to pull out five random cards. It doesn't matter where from. All right, so now I'm going to turn around, and Dr. Davidson is going to hide one of these cards. He's going to show it to, um, to you guys before he hides it so that you know I'm actually guessing a card, the right card. And he's going to put that card face down, um, the others face up, kind of like this. And I'm going to then turn around and guess what the, well, not guess, um, <laughs> I'm going to know magically what the hidden card is. <laughs> So I'll turn around now. card is going to be the five of diamonds. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to explain how I did that trick now. <laughs> All right. So this trick, the Fitch Cheney five, five card trick, um, revolves around the pigeonhole principle, which tells us that if you have, in this case, five cards or pigeons, I drew these, by the way. <laughs> so if you have five pigeons and only four holes, in this case, the holes are the suits, then there will always be at least one hole or suit with more than one card in it. All right, so... From that, um, whatever cards uh, Dr. Sharp picked out, you, you would uh, be able to know that there's going to be at least two cards of the same suit. Um, often it's more than two, but it's going to be at least two cards of the same suit. And so what Dr. Davidson did was he picked two of these cards that were the same and then picked one of them to be the key card. Um, so that would tell me, the magician, that this card, the hidden card, is the same suit as this card, the following card. Um, well, that leaves me with 12 other possible cards that the whole card could be. And so now we have these three cards to give me more information. Um, and according to permutation, there are three factorial or six ways for these cards to be arranged. So what we do is establish a, um, a different number for every possible combination. And so if you have any two cards in one suit, um, you'll notice from this chart here that any two cards can be at most six spaces apart. So if you have like a king and a six, they're gonna be at most six spaces apart. Um, but of course they can be one, two, three, four, five, or six. So depending on how Dr. Davidson would position, the last three cards would tell me how far apart the whole card is from the key card. Um, and then we also establish that in case you get, like say you get three kings, um, we have a hierarchy for the suits for clubs, diamonds, and hearts, and spades. And we just did it alphabetically so that we wouldn't mess up. <laughs> and we didn't, so. <laughs> okay, so take this example. Um, if we had gotten these cards and Dr. Davidson had 
uh, presented them in this order. That would tell me that they're middle, low, high, which corresponds to the three over here. So I would know that the whole card is three spaces up from the key card. So it would be the six of spades. All right. <laughs> so um, how does this work for proof? Um, I used Hall's marriage theorem, which is uh, based on graph theory. And it tells us that um, when we have G, which is a bipartite graph, um, with bipartitions A, B, there is going to be a matching that covers A, if and only if, for every subset of X. Every subset X of A, um, N of X, should be greater than or equal to the absolute value of X. So um, in simpler terms, imagine that you have four students looking for a job, and you have four positions available to fill. Um, not all students are equal. Some are smarter than others. Uh, so the companies want to hire the smartest students. But we're going to assume in this case that um, a student is going to take any job they can get. For a set of n companies, um, we are going to denote s as the number of students that at least one of these companies want. And if s is greater than n for every set of companies, in this case, Blizzard, Apple, Google, and Costco, then a matching is possible. And otherwise, the matching fails. So it's pretty simple. It tells you when it's going to work, and it tells you when it's going to fail. So in this case, you might have noticed that core key is wanted by Blizzard and Google. But of course, core key can only work for one company. Um, I don't think you could work for both. And so this matching would, would fail because one is not greater than two. All right. So I used this to create a proof for, um, for this card trick that just tells us that we define A as a set, as the M subset of N cards. So in this case, the M subset would be, um, would be five out of 52 cards. Um, and then B as all the possible arrangements for the M subset. For general M and N, the number of vertices in each part of the bipartite graph is N choose M, and M minus one factorial times N choose M minus one. So the maximum number of cards, sorry, in the deck that can be used in the trick is defined by N equals M factorial plus M minus one. And I found it interesting that um, this, this tells us that the maximum number of cards that could be used for this trick I believe was 124, um, which I don't think anyone's ever actually performed it using that many cards because that would probably, that would be really difficult. <laughs> but it's possible. It can be done. Um, and the bipartite graph for the maximum deck um, has this many vertices in each, in each part of the graph. And this tells us that they're equal. And therefore, I use the proof by contradiction that tells us that because our graph has perfect matching, which is um, what Hall's theorem tells us, Hall's theorem tells us when a graph is going to be a perfect match. Because we do have a perfect match, um, and we've established that they have the same degree in each vertice, we assume that there is a subset of k vertices on one side of the graph that connects to less than k vertices on the other side. The number of edges incident to the vertices in this subset is going to be exactly k times n factorial um, if the number of distinct vertices incident to these edges on the opposite side of the graph is less than k, then using the extended pigeonhole principle, one of the vertices on the opposite side of the graph must have strictly more than k times n factorial over k equals n factorial edges incident to it. And this is now a contradiction since we previously established that every vertex in G has a degree of exactly n factorial. And that's the proofs I have. <laughs> Any questions? This one? Okay. You just wanted to look at it. Yeah, what's the statement? Sorry, this is a lot. Uh, what's the statement of the, the what? We're proving this card trick, right? So mm -hmm. there's, there's a theorem that you can use. Yeah. Uh, what is the statement of the theorem that you're using? Um, 
Um, okay, so I believe I wrote that in like just the previous part of my thesis, like a couple yeah. of lines before this. So the statement was, okay, um, that the two graphs for um, the, the bipartite sets are going to be a perfect, perfect match. So that was the, that was the statement before this. Yeah, probably should have included that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wonder that too. <laughs> How many trees could you create and was one more difficult to, to create than the other? And was that due to the complexity of the trick or the number of cards involved? Yeah, so for, if we go back to, okay, for, uh, if we go back to this proof. Um, so since it did, previously I had like a, I had a much longer way of trying to prove the trick. Um, and it had, I put a lot of different variables in it. Um, and it was really confusing to read for myself. I remember I sent it to Dr. Davidson and he was just kind of like, what? <laughs> like this, this doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, it was just, it was really long when I first made it and like that can happen sometimes when you're trying to make a proof. Um, like I was overcomplicating it because um, a lot of times the best, well, most of the time the best proofs are very simple and short. So I would say this one was probably the most difficult one to come up with. So was that too, what did that have to do with the nature of the trick itself? Um, I think possibly because there were 27 cards involved versus um, there only being the five cards involved in the other trick. I think that that's something that played into it being a little more difficult to, um, you know, kind of condense it and make it easier to follow. Yeah. Yes. Um, so there is a general, uh, a generalized, like version of the trick, and I believe you could do. I don't remember like the maximum number. I don't even know if there is a maximum number. I remember um, reading a lot of, um, what is it called? Exchange or stack exchange or that um, math oh. thing that people, yeah, yeah math, ex math stack exchange, um, where everybody was like trying to like show that there was like a larger number of cards you could do this with. And somebody was like, no, there's an even a larger number. And just people, adding on to that. Um, but yeah, I do believe there's like four to the fourth power um, and so forth. So yes, yes. The base would change. Yeah. Yeah. But you can, you can do that. Um, that would take a lot longer for me to do than <laughs> this one. So yeah, but it'd be interesting to, to watch somebody do that. Definitely. Any other questions? Um, it was really just like seeing the YouTube video of that one guy performing the tricks and he has some other cool videos on the topics. Um, and then Dr. Davidson just recently let me borrow a book of his. So, you know, he really makes, um, a lot of these math concepts very fun and more engaging than just, you know, me picking up a textbook and reading about it. So I think that's what attracted me to this. Yes. Yeah, I've been a math major since like the moment. Yeah, I've been a math major all four years. Yep. <laughs> um, no, no, no gambling here. But um, I'm not sure. <laughs> not sure yet. I have a fun trick that I learned when I was like 12. Mm -hmm. that we don't have to get into it right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And somehow the number of cards in the pile ends up being the number, and that never ever made sense to me. And it still isn't going to make sense to me, but 
Yeah, I'm sh I'm sure there's some. Yeah, I'm sure there's some cool mathematical explanation behind it because a lot of times people think that like tricks are like. I mean, some people do believe in magic, um, and then other people think that. I mean, they can be you know cheating or some sleight of hand, but a lot of the most sophisticated math tricks, um, well, card tricks are actually based on math. So yeah. I think you definitely could. Um, I'm not sure if I could create something as complex as this one. I mean, it's not super complex, but I just not not sure if I personally could come up with it. Um, I know there's uh, another trick that I learned, which is basically just flipping cards over in different orders and splitting the decks. Um, I think I could probably come up with something similar to that, um, or just like basing it off of another trick. But I'm not sure. How, how difficult it would be to just come up with something completely new. Any other questions?